How many of you have been, have been to Gettysburg? Terrific. I often call it a pilgrimage to go there because of the uh, suffering uh, that went on there. And I think it's very fitting that we take a few minutes this evening just to remember what went on. Not far from here, there is a Union soldier at the crossroads of the Guilford Green. And if you walk around the soldier, you'll see the names of the men of Guilford who died in the war. And on one side, there's an inscription. And it reads, in honor of those who served, the grateful town erects this monument that their example may speak to coming generations. And I think that's our job tonight is to, we're the coming generations, and it's our responsibility to, to uh, pay tribute to these uh, brave men and women. Probably less than a tenth of a mile from here lies the grave of Aaron Landfair, winner of the Medal of Honor, First Lieutenant, Company B, First Connecticut Cavalry. Connecticut in the 1860s probably did not have a large population, and Brantford uh, certainly wasn't very large. But uh, each regiment typically had somewhere between 500 and 1,000 soldiers. <clears throat> These were volunteers. They raised 13 infantry regiments, five batteries of artillery. There were two units of US colored troops, as they were called at that time, and one cavalry of regiment. <clears throat> well, let's go back to 150 years ago, on the uh, 1st to the 3rd of July, 1863. What's going on? <clears throat> well, General Lee, uh, being an astute commander, realizes that having a simply defensive position, trying to protect the South, is not a tenable situation. The North has twice or three times as much railroad, industry, and since the Emancipation Proclamation, now has thousands of free uh, black men who are willing to take up arms. So he decides that the only solution is a political one, <coughs> invade the North and force a compromise. The Copperheads uh, are threatening to win the election from Lincoln. Lincoln's popularity is sinking, and this is the maneuver that he'll try. Lincoln, on the other hand, has been through a number of generals, and three days before the Battle of Gettysburg, picks George G. Meade to command the Union troops. Now, he didn't ask me if he wanted to be commander. He had gone through so many, he simply told him, you are the commander. There's no choice here. So Lee begins to move toward Carlisle, Harrisburg, <clears throat> possibly even Pennsylvania, into Philadelphia. Meade is instructed to follow Lee but to interpose himself between the capital so that the Confederate Army doesn't swing south again and capture Washington, D.C., as they have threatened to do on a couple of occasions. It's the largest land battle on the North American continent, 158,000 soldiers. The logistics of trying to feed and move that many people is just amazing. Even if we tried to do it today, with automobiles and buses, trains, to move 160,000 people uh, in, in 90 degree heat is uh, amazing. The two armies were relatively equally matched, about 75,000 Confederates and 83,000 Union soldiers. Of that, 
there eventually were 51,000 battle casualties, 23,000 on the Union and 28,000 on the Confederates. This is a uh, photograph after the battle. Um, and this is what brought the war home. We're pretty used to having CNN show us uh, battle footage almost as soon as it happens. But in that day and age, this was pretty quick. And it was stunning and frightening to the population of both the North and the South. Well, how did I get interested in this? We used to live very close to Gettysburg. But uh, after our daughter uh, went to West Point, and I had no children left at home, something came into me and I said, I think I'll join the Army. And so I'm a colonel in the National Guard, uh, still serving. And I became more and more interested in uh, military medicine. So what were the doctors like in the Army? Um, this is McClellan standing here. You can see how much shorter he is than the president, particularly with his tall black hat on. But the gentleman standing right next to President Lincoln with his hands clasped over his belt buckle is Jonathan Letterman, one of the uh, pioneers of Army medicine in 1863, and I'll explain why. Well, how good were these doctors? Well, the Surgeon General Report of November 1862 said that about three quarters were good and about 25% were bad. I don't know what criteria they used, but most of them hadn't gone to medical school, certainly not in England. They had just <clears throat> apprenticed with another doctor. The state of American medicine at that point was far behind Europe. Harvard Medical School, that we hold in so much esteem, did not have a stethoscope or microscope during the time of the Civil War. Initially, there were probably less than 100 active duty physicians, largely working out in the West in the forts. By the time the war ended, there were 12,000 Union physicians. Most of them, again, were what we would say are volunteer or regimental, what we have as National Guard type doctors. Very small sliver of them were regular army. A good chunk were contracted to serve in the army. And you can see the very small sliver of surgeons that were assigned to the colored troops. Now, by the end of the war, there were 200,000 black Americans serving in the army. And there were actually more deaths amongst the African American troops than the white troops, which I'll explain in a moment. Well, how were you treated? One physician kept opium in one pocket and mercury in the other. When the patient came in, the doctor said, how are your bowels? If they were too loose, he gave them opium. If the soldier was constipated, he received a pinch of mercury. This is from a illustration by Winslow Homer called Sick Call. And you can see the patient obligingly sticking out his tongue and sick call. Well, we know that quite a few of the soldiers unfortunately succumbed during surgery. It says a good surgeon could amputate a limb in under 10 minutes. Part of the problem was that anesthesia was still in its infancy. There was anesthesia. Chloroform had been demonstrated and ether as an anesthetic agent at the Massachusetts General Hospital in about the 1840s. So by the time the Civil War began, all of the physicians had an ether administrator. But this is a fairly typical example 
Private Bradley, Company D. Slight wound of the patella. Admitted June 25th with necrosis and gangrene. July 18th, amputation at the middle of the thigh. There was little blood loss, but the patient sank under the operation and expired a few minutes later. The chloroform may have, by its depressing effect, contributed to this unfavorable result, for it caused him to vomit free freely. Now, today, you would be kept NPO, or you wouldn't have anything to take by mouth after midnight, so that when you entered the operating room, no matter what time, you would be there on an empty stomach. And then typically, after they put you to sleep, they would insert a nasogastric tube to suck out whatever was, was left in your stomach, just in the event that if you threw up, it wouldn't aspirate into your lungs. But they didn't really understand this. They didn't have supplemental oxygen. They didn't have positive pressure to ventilate you in the event that you stopped breathing. So they had to give you enough anesthesia so you weren't jumping off the table, but not so much anesthesia that you would stop breathing. That's called level three anesthesia. And it's a very difficult phase to get somebody to level three and leave them there. The chief danger of chloroform is that in its administration, care is not, is not taken to let the patient inhale sufficient air with it. And the patients die not from the chloroform, but from the want of oxygen. I remember very clearly a couple things in my life. When I was about five, had my tonsils out. And one of my earliest memories was having the gauze on my nose and waking up and smelling the chloroform still. The second was many years later when I was a first year medical student at Yale and we were doing a physiology experiment using rabbits. And our instructor came by and said, look at your rabbit's pupils. And the four of us looked at the eye and we said, wow, the pupils are really big. And he said, what did you do? I said, I don't know. He said, you killed the rabbit with the ether. So we were using open drop ether. Take a handkerchief, put it over the nose of the bunny, and drop ether on it. Of course, you're etherizing yourself as well as the bunny, but you don't do, we weren't instructed on how to do mouth to nose respiration on the animal, and therefore our experiment ended pretty quickly. Well, that was the same thing that was going on here in that the soldiers aren't intubated and there's no means to ventilate them. All right, how many teeth did a soldier need to have? Well, you actually have to have four, the two front teeth and the bottom two teeth, and the purpose was to yank the cartridge open, right? Yank the cartridge open, pour the powder down the barrel, put the mini ball in, ramrod it down. So that was one of the criteria. This again is another illustration by Winslow Homer. He was hired as an illustrator because the photographic equipment at the time was too slow to take action pictures. So he went with this sketch pad and you can see this painting at um, the main museum of art, I believe. But he has many, many of these Civil War illustrations. These were the disqualifying criteria. Imbecility, epilepsy, loss of sight in the right eye, loss of front teeth, loss of right thumb, and developed tuberculosis. The medical officer is to examine him stripped to see that he has full use of his limbs his chest is ample, that he is not subject to convulsions, and has no infectious disease that may unfit him for military service. Well, they didn't do too good an exam on Albert Cashier, because Albert was actually a woman. And they estimate there were 400 
female soldiers serving in the U.S. Army. Some of them came to light when after the war they applied for their pension. They said, well, you're Albert Cashier. They said, no, I'm Mary Cashier. <laughs> well, where's Albert? Well, I was Albert during the war, and then I reverted to being a female again after the war was over. Interesting. Were there African American regiments at Gettysburg? The answer is, uh, there were not. Uh, in the Emancipation Proclamation, President Lincoln asked for African American volunteers to serve in the Army. In fact, the reason he promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation was that they were running out of volunteers. And so they had to resort either to a draft or to what he knew was literally an unlimited supply of African American soldiers. And so one of the first regiments, the 54th Massachusetts, was still in training at that point and about to go to South Carolina. If you're in Boston, across from the State House, is this truly remarkable large bronze tribute to the soldiers of the 54th Massachusetts. Each of those figures, the artist, the sculptor, used an actual individual. And you can see the uh, composition also at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Notice it says, pay $13 a month. But for the first year, there was great controversy because the African American soldiers were not paid what the white soldiers were paid. And so many of them refused their pay until there was parity. <clears throat> well, we do know that there was a Chinese American soldier <clears throat> at Gettysburg. <clears throat> His name was Corporal Joseph Pierce. He was born in Canton, China in 1842 and reportedly sold for $6 to a whaling captain of Kensington and brought to the United States. He was working as a farmer in Berlin when the war broke out and he volunteered to serve with the 14th Connecticut Volunteers. It was said, somewhat pejoratively, he was the only Chinaman in the Army of the Potomac. He was wounded and was granted a pension and uh, is buried here in Connecticut. Well, what about nursing? What was the salary of the superintendent of Union Nurses? She was called Dragon Dix because she was always so stern and clashed with the military bureaucracy. So the soldiers were being 13, paid $13 a month. How much was she being paid? Well, nothing. You know, we still have a disparity between a woman in 2014 doing the same job as a man, but there's about a 30, 30 cent differential. Unfortunately, people are trying to redress that inequity. So the government accepted the services of Dorothy Dix, but it said it, it would have to be free. So she'd have to do it as a volunteer. Well, what did the nurses look like? They certainly didn't look like the nurses that we have today. Miss Dix said, it is indecorous for angels of mercy to appear otherwise than gray-haired and spectacled. <laughs> Such a thing as a hospital corps of comely young maiden nurses possessing grace and good looks was unknown. <laughs> they might cause too much excitement. <laughs> well, if you go to Gettysburg, you need to spend some time right in the downtown area. Now, it's a little strange because there are modern cars going back and forth, but just kind of take them out of your memory 
and put yourself back 150 years ago at Christ Lutheran Church. They had 10 wounded soldiers. There's 50,000 wounded soldiers, and the town of Gettysburg has 3,000 people. And the Confederates couldn't take their wounded with them. They had to beat a path back to the Potomac and escape from Meade. And so they laid them out on boards across the back of the pews. And they have a wonderful program in the evening with Civil War music and readings from some of the young women who came from the neighborhood to provide comfort to the wounded soldiers. Well, the male doctors and female nurses often clashed. I think that still is the case today. We tell our interns, if you know best, you'll listen to what the nurse said, but listen to this encounter between a doctor and a nurse. A sick soldier, poor, prostate, and emaciated, asked for some eggs. The doctor told him eggs were difficult to digest. His bowel was weak. Eggs are forbidden. The nurse overruled the doctor and gave the soldier eggs. The doctor became enraged when he saw the soldier hungrily eating the eggs provided by the nurse. The argument ended in a compromise. The soldier could not eat the eggs, but he could feel them with his hands. <laughs> Which wound was more common, a chest wound or an extremity wound? This is a photograph I took about 10 years ago in Iraq. And when our infantry go into battle, they wear body armor, something that was, of course, unknown in that time. And this is the ceramic plate that covers your chest. And the soldier is using his finger to show the hole that was indented by an enemy bullet. Well, in the Civil War, you typically found a rock or tree and hid behind it, thereby exposing your head and your extremities. So you can see that extremity wounds uh, accounted for the majority of the injuries. And as a result, you then had amputations you then had infections, gangrene, uh, bacterial infections, and death because there were no antibiotics until about World War II. What caused the casualties? Well, certainly artillery is a frightening event if you've ever been one, near one of these black powder type weapons. But most of them were caused by rifle bullets rather than the bayonet. <clears throat> During the Civil War, they used a type of projectile which had been developed in France by many. It was a large, soft lead bullet. And when it hit one of your bones, it would shatter them. It would also carry in dirt and clothing or fabric into the wound causing infection. At the Army Medical Hospital in Washington, D.C., you can actually visit the leg of Major General Daniel Sickles. Sickles figured largely on the second day of the battle in a place called the Peach Orchard. And after being wounded in the leg, his regimental surgeon, Dr. Sim, amputated, wrapped and preserved the leg, and presented it to General Sickles, who then donated it to the Army Medical Museum. For years afterwards, he delighted in taking his friends there to visit his leg. More soldiers died of disease than died of actual war wounds. This is from an Atlanta hospital, December 1863 to June 64. Gunshot wounds account for only about 25% of the deaths. 
most of them are causing from diarrhea, <clears throat> malaria, and contagious diseases like typhoid fever and measles. The um, African American soldiers, at least those from the South, and white soldiers from the farms had much greater mortality than white soldiers coming from the cities. And the reason was simple. They had not been exposed to the usual childhood diseases that soldiers who came from the bustling cities of Philadelphia, New York, Washington, Baltimore had been exposed to. So just as much as when explorers uh, carry diseases into societies that have had very little exposure to common, what we call common, common viral diseases, uh, it results in uh, significant morbidity. The recruits that have joined us are affected with measles and camp fever so that instead of being an advantage to us, they are an element of weakness, a burden. Even President Lincoln, little boy, died of what was believed typhoid fever because of a well that was contaminated that was serving the White House. Throughout the war, 560,000 soldiers died from disease. Two soldiers died of dysentery, diarrhea, typhoid, or malaria for every one killed in battle. <clears throat> Beans killed more than bullets, mortality from typhoid fever. Well, what was the state of our army evacuation services during the war? It, it was pretty poor to begin. In August of 1862, there was no ambulance corps in either the Union or the Confederate Army. If you were wounded, you laid on that battleground without water or without any medical care until somebody came by to pick you up. Today, you can see that, uh, well, so they were on the battlefield up to 24 hours at Bull Run. Letterman, uh, pioneered a system of ambulances and a dedicated ambulance corps to get the soldiers off the battlefield and brought down that time to about eight hours. Because, you know, it was considered a miracle to do that. By the time of the Korean War, it was down to an hour, and now it can be less than half an hour from the time you're wounded until you're in a military surgical hospital. Well, who was the oldest general? I think that uh, is claimed by Brevet General George Green. Well, where was Green? The Union forces are illustrated by the green line, which looks like an upside down fish hook. The town of Gettysburg is here, and Little Round Top sits at the end of the shank of the fish hook. On the first, second, and third days, the Confederate armies are converging on the rounded part of that fish hook, and that's where green is. So for three days, he, he battled it out up there. Now, Green was a professor at West Point of engineering. And he knew a little bit about uh, how to fight. And they said to him, uh, General Green, we're going to stand up and fight. And he said, no. He says, take it from me, and I'm an engineer. You get that shovel and start digging a foxhole and get that rock and pile it up and give yourself a breastwork to fight behind because they were uh, outnumbered. Uh, his regiment was being confronted by divisions of Confederate soldiers. 
But using good uh, engineering skills, he laid out this breastwork so that his men could fight from behind them using that protection. <clears throat> well, Green was actually wounded in the jaw. He got shot in the jaw. And when the war concluded, <clears throat> he went to the uh, disability board and said, you know, I fought in the Civil War and I'd like a pension. My name is General Green. So they looked up his roster and they said, no, you're Lieutenant Green. At West Point, you teach engineering. He says, no, I'm General Green. And they said, well, you're a Brevet General, B-R-E-V-E-T. That means temporary state general, not regular army general. You're a lieutenant. We'll give you a lieutenant's pension. So he did end up, end up with a pension, but it wasn't quite the pension that he thought he would be getting. Well, on day two, we have the uh, battle that is figured uh, in uh, the movies, uh, Civil War, in which the Longstreet attempts to come around the left flank of the Union line. Now, Meade has only been there for a day. He arrived late on the day, first day. And a, a, a soldier is there, a commander, uh, named Joshua Chamberlain. Now, who is Joshua Chamberlain? Chamberlain was a professor of foreign languages at Bowdoin College in Maine. And uh, the school wasn't excited about him going off to fight because he might be killed and they'd lose their professor of foreign languages. So they said, we'll give you a three-year sabbatical to go to England or Europe to study. So he took his sabbatical, went to Augusta, and said to the governor, I'll raise, I'll raise a regiment of soldiers using all my contacts with the college kids. And so they said, we'll make you a colonel. He says, well, I really don't know anything about soldiering. Why don't you make me a lieutenant colonel? So they made him a lieutenant colonel, but by the time they got to Gettysburg, he had now been promoted. So that's Little Round Top. It's the far left end <coughs> of the uh, Union line. There are lots of rocks and his soldiers are fighting from behind that position. Longstreet wants to swing around him, outflank him, and get behind the Union lines. And so they tell him, you've got to hold this position no matter what the cost. And he does. He holds it against three or four charges from the Confederates until he finally exhausts all of his ammunition. It's getting pretty late at that hour. There's a lot of confusion, tremendous amount of smoke on the battlefield, and he's not sure if he can hold them back a fourth time. And he says to his men, bayonets, <clears throat> and then says, charge. And they sweep the rebel forces from the field with a little bit of help from another company that he has hidden, and they effectively blunt that attack on the left end of the Union line. So I encourage you to go to Gettysburg, and if you have time to uh, get up to Little Round Top, if, uh, you can even hire a guide for $50 or so, and they'll take you right there and show you right where the spot is. There are monuments and markers that say, this was the Chamberlain spot where he stood with the flag. Now, years later, Oates, who was the commander of the Confederate forces attacking, said, now this is long after the war's over. We're supposed to be friends. He says, I'd like to put a marker where the Alabama troops were. <coughs> but of course, the Park Service, or what it was then, was in control of Union hands. And they said, no, you're not putting any marker here for the Alabama troops. So we know that they were very, very close by. But Feelings go a long way. Now, you see the colors right behind Chamberlain. No walkie-talkies, no means of communication, lots of smoke. So where the commander is, 
The flag is there. Now, of course, the enemy knows that too. Start shooting toward the flag and you'll get the commander. But that's your responsibility if you're the color bearer, is to hold up the flag so that your troops know where you are. And that's the job of the commander is to stand next to the flag to direct the operation. Well, why did Lee attack on that evening uh, of July 2nd? In retrospect, it was uh, not a wise thing to do, but putting yourself into his boots, he didn't have a whole lot of choices. <coughs> he could either turn around and head back to Virginia <clears throat> but that would put him back on the defensive. He had come very close on the first and second day to breaking through the Union lines. He had tried on the first day on the right, second day on the left, and so third day would be right up the gut. He got 12,000 soldiers together and said, you need to do it. There are lots of theories as to why Lee ordered that charge on the third day, Pickett's charge. He wanted to convince France and England to come in on the side of the South. Now the South produced cotton. Cotton went to England through New York Harbor. The English mills were standing fallow without cotton from the South. So there had some economic interest in recognizing the South. McClellan, who had been fired by Lincoln, was going to run on the Democratic ticket against Lincoln to have a truce, divide the country, have a northern United States and a southern United States. And there was a general feeling that he was the ultimate strategist he was against the neophyte Meade, who had only been there for a few days, and that he had the strength of the Confederate soldier. So Lee calls a council of war that evening. And Lee says, if the enemy is there tomorrow, we must attack him. Now, Stonewall Jackson is dead. He died of friendly fire. And so Lee's number two man is now James Longstreet. And Longstreet, with great respect, says to Lee, General, I have been a soldier all my life. I have been with soldiers engaged in fights by couples, by squads, companies, regiments, and armies. And I know what soldiers can do. And it is my opinion that no 15,000 men can take that position. So he was right, but he was uh, maligned for saying that. He had a defeatist attitude. Um, well, on the other side of the line, there was a Union Council of War. Meade was getting, you know, his feet were a little bit slippery too. He wasn't sure what to do. So he called all the generals together and said, what should we do? Should we run? Should we attack? Or just stay in place? And uh, there was an inquiry after the war as to who said what. But Hancock said, the commanders said they wished to fight the battle there. And General Meade announced that to be the decision. General Oliver O. Howard was at that meeting. If you know, in Washington, D.C., there is a university and medical school called Howard University. It's for African-American students, primarily. It was founded by Oliver Howard, a graduate of West Point and Bowdoin College. He lost an arm during the war. But Howard set up the Freedman's um, Committee to educate and provide jobs for the freed African Americans. And Howard at that meeting said, General Meade, we have done enough retreating. So they held their position 
and they had the better ground and better defenses. Why did the Union win at Gettysburg? Well, number one, their lines were more compact. They were sitting on top of the highest point, which was Cemetery Ridge. Their line stretched about two miles. The Confederates were on the opposite ridge, Seminary Ridge, in a line of five or six miles. And so, in a day when all communication was done by horses, it's certainly easier to shift your troops if your battle line's only two miles in length versus six or seven. Secondly, the Union's uh, soldiers were fighting defensively as opposed to fighting uh, and charging the enemy. You can go there today. The Park Service cuts down all the trees on the battlefield to keep it looking like it did then. If they let it go, it would become a forest and we wouldn't see anything. So every time a little tree starts to grow up, they go out there and cut it down and take it away. But there's tall, tall grass between the Confederate lines and the Union lines. But they get a tractor and they bulldoze and they cut the grass down uh, so that you can walk from the Confederate lines to the Union line. Now that's about a mile. It takes you about 20 minutes to do the walk. It's very quiet. It's peaceful. It's a beautiful walk. But you can imagine charging, running at top speed that one mile with cannon and rifle fire uh, shooting at you. And it, it just makes you shake even though uh, there is literally no one who would hurt you. <clears throat> well, the battle is over. There are dead people everywhere. Who's going to bury them? Well, nobody knew. Nobody had responsibility for it. There were thousands of people unburied on the battlefield. <coughs> And so the federal government, in its great wisdom, said, I, I guess that's our responsibility. And so it began hiring laborers to bury them. And it used the Evergreen Cemetery, which the town of Gettysburg had right there. And if you go there, you can see a nice semicircle of all of the state flags uh, that were represented in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York. The largest number of soldiers were from New York. There's a good chunk of from Connecticut as well in Evergreen Cemetery. And so they wanted to have a fitting ceremony uh, to dedicate the first national cemetery for fallen soldiers. And they asked um, what was then the greatest orator of the day, Edwards, to uh, come down and speak. He had been president of Harvard University and was considered one of the greatest orators. And then at the last moment, they asked President Lincoln to make a few brief remarks. He was not the principal speaker. The person coordinating all of this was David Wills, a prominent businessman in Gettysburg. His home today is now part of the National Park Service. You can enter the home and walk upstairs and see the actual bedroom and bed where President Lincoln slept uh, the night before the address, where he put his finishing touches on the address. So I'm not sure where this idea came from that he wrote the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope. He had been thinking about the, about the message of the Gettysburg Address for many weeks. Indeed, right after the Battle of Gettysburg, which was then followed by the victory at Vicksburg, a crowd had come to the White House and he had stood on the portico and said something of the nature of, how long have we been a nation, 80 odd years? Something of that frame. He wasn't exactly sure how old the Union was. But, uh, he had most of the address written by the time he got there and then completed it uh, that night. After he gave the address, uh, 
it was recognized as such an important piece of literature as well as of a public statement that a number of people asked him for a copy of it. And so there are about five copies of the Gettysburg Address which, have been, which were handwritten by the president. <coughs> the address was very short, 200 words. It took about two minutes to deliver. And at the end of the speech, he sat down and he said, I'm afraid this speech won't scour. Now that's a metaphor dating back to his days when he was a laborer and they would use a plow to turn the soil over and a plow that wasn't uh, constructed well enough to turn the soil over was one that wouldn't scour. But little did he know that uh, his speech would be one of the greatest speeches that we know of today. The photographer was trying to get a picture of Lincoln. He's not the fellow with the beard in the tall black hat, who we would think would be President Lincoln. He's uh, uncovered over here. Um, so the photographer is trying to set up this bulky apparatus with the flash and all that, but by the time he's got it set and takes the picture, he's done with his remarks. Um, did you bring the books? <laughs> well, if you go on to Lion Libraries online, Lion, everybody been on Lion? <laughs> and just uh, search under Lincoln, you'll find there are probably 16,000 books about Lincoln. Now, if you use Lincoln just as a topic, there's 50,000. So they say there are as many, uh, the only person who exceeds Lincoln in terms of books is Jesus Christ. Now why is there so much interest in President Lincoln? Well, you can take this videotape out or get the book called Looking for Lincoln. And it's a, it's a great piece. Uh, and it talks, it addresses this issue of why Lincoln resonates with all of us in a certain way. Probably none of us were rail splitters. Probably all of us had more than the year of education that he had. But there are parts of him that all of us can see in ourselves. <clears throat> I took this photograph at the Lincoln Library in Springfield, Illinois. Now, when you go to most of the presidential libraries, it's always look but don't touch. Everything's behind glass. <clears throat> when you walk into the rotunda of the Lincoln Library and Museum, he's standing right there with his family. There's Tad and Mary and Robert. You can walk right up to him. I, I was just amazed. I saw Hispanic families. African-American families, all kinds of people taking group photos with the president. It's truly an amazing experience to get, quote, that close to the president. But I think that's who he was for several hours every day. He would hold open sessions, and people would come in and say, I need a job, or my brother was wounded or my son uh, is about to be shot for desertion or falling asleep on duty. And he would listen patiently to all these people. <coughs> they said, why are you wasting your time listening to all these people and their troubles? And he said, because that's the only way I can get the pulse of the people, is to listen to them. So I encourage you, if you have the time or if you're passing through Illinois, take some time to uh, visit the uh, Lincoln Library and Museum. Well, that concludes all I have to say tonight. Uh, I know many of you know more about Gettysburg than I do. Tom and Valerie, is that right? Sure. 
George and Valerie, spent 10 days there during the sesquicentennial last year. Uh, George uh, hired uh, General Lee to come to dinner to meet the 10 people that he brought down there. I was telling George and his wife that we went to dinner at one of these, uh, you know, $5 all-you-can-eat buffets, and I walked in, and the, the table next to me was General Robert E. Lee and his wife. I said, I walked up, I said, are you having fried chicken this evening, General? And he uh, smiled at me. So I thought perhaps we could conclude tonight by uh, reciting the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it's under two minutes, and I think it still speaks to us as much as President Lincoln wanted to speak to us 150 years ago. So let's, let's all read together. <coughs> Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate it. We cannot consecrate it. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know or long remember what we see here, but it cannot forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who brought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great tasks remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you again. I appreciate all of you being here this evening. They sweep our floors. They fix our cars. They manage our companies. They teach our children. They direct our films. And when our country calls, they answer. No matter the cost or sacrifice. They leave behind their hometowns and their jobs, their friends, and family, ready to answer whenever duty calls. They are not easy to spot, because sometimes heroes don't wear capes. The warrior citizens of the United States Army Reserve. Learn more at GoArmyReserve.com. We may not look the same or dress the same. We may live in different places and lead different lives, but we are all athletes. We are all persistent, 
Relentless. And stubborn. We love speed. We aim for perfection. We work through pain. We don't let people tell us who we are or who we should be. We don't give up when things get tough. We don't take no for an answer. We all strive. We all struggle. We all persevere. We all support each other. Our lives may differ. But we are all dreamers. Competitors. Champions. Teammates. We are all athletes. Lost my brother Frank in the Battle of Iwo Jima. He served on four combat tours in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. There's a life that was lost behind that pen. I put it on for my wife, for my husband, my brother, my dad, my son. We wear it because we honor those that we lost. To learn more about the stories behind the Gold Star Pins, visit goldstarpins.org. Hey, it's getting cold out there. You know what that means? Well, yes, but you also need to get your car ready for the winter. Your tire tread should measure at least 5 30 seconds of an inch deep, replace your windshield wipers, and change all fluids. You must also prepare for just-in-case emergencies. In your car, you should have blankets, extra clothes, a first aid kit, water, in case you get stuck somewhere, kitty litter, jumper cables, windshield scraper, flashlight, and batteries. Remember, drive smarter to arrive safer.